new series, all right? East, Easter gone. Easter gone. We're, we're, we're starting it fresh, okay? Last week was good. Come on. It was, there. It, was, it was such a good day. Had a great time. But we're starting something new, and this is actually one of my most, most favoritists, most favorite series that we do every single year is a series on family. But I got to start it off on this, on this other note to say, why is it, why is it that people that we love the most often get the worst of us? Ooh, man, why you got to be so negative? Well, let me be positive. I'm positive that the people we love the most tend to get the worst from us. I know this, marriage is hard. Straight up, this is a place of truth right here, so I got to tell the truth to you. Marriage is hard, and if that wasn't bad enough, parenting can be even harder. Come on, anybody with kids say amen over here. It's hard. It is hard. It is hard. But lucky for us, there is a book on marriage. There is a book on parenting. It's called the B-I-B-L-E. It's the Word of God, man, and we all got access to it. And if we would just tap into this wonderful, rich resource that we can learn how to have a better marriage how to have a better family, better home life. And if that's what you're looking for today, then this series, this series is for you. All right, before we jump into all the content, though, I got a couple little announcements for you. Normally, every single month, we do what's called First Wednesday. And guess when it happens? On the first Wednesday of the month. But because the first Wednesday was right after Easter and y'all did three services back to back to back to back to back, and the dream team is going like this. Ah, oh, it's so hard. I can't do it. But because of all of your hard work, let me just like on the heels of that, on the heels of that, we saw over 400 people in church last week. No, 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 no. That's nothing. 37 people made commitments for Jesus last week. Come on. Let's give Jesus the highest praise for that. It's awesome. 37 people checked. I'm ready to begin a brand new relationship with him. Dream team, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for showing up early, hanging in there late. Man, it was tough, man. Three services, it was hard. It was hard for all of us. And I'm just letting you know, man, one of these days, we're going to have to get a bigger boat. You know what I'm saying? We're going to have to do something special, but you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when it comes. It's going to be great. So second Wednesday is this Wednesday. And my friend and pastor, Pastor Brian Goodell is going to be here. Man, I'm just letting you know, not only is he a man who's accurate with the word of God. So this, this Wednesday coming up, 6.30, childcare and everything, a whole evening service for you. Once a month we do this. But like, he, he, he's a great preacher and everything, but he is a sharp dresser. Just look at that fedora right now. Huh? You want to get inspired on like, how, I'm just kidding. He's awesome. And he's actually my direct overseer. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege that he's going to come and bring the word. Get excited for that. Also get excited for this next Wednesday. Everyone say, or next Wednesday. No, 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 no. Sunday. I'm talking about Sunday now. A week from today. A week from today, um, I have a very special friend coming. Maybe you've heard of him. His name is Pastor uh, Glenn Barnes from First Baptist right here in Lodi. Probably one of the biggest ministries in all of our city. Pastor Glenn is going to come here to preach on family and marriage and parenting, the whole deal. And I'm, I'm really honored. And so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Since Pastor Glenn is coming, I would love for you to show up and show out for him. I love how we do this every, every uh, first Wednesday service too. Like y'all stand up and, and clap down like the visiting person. I think that's a real show of honor. And so I would love for us to do that next week. Bring some friends, bring some people. Because this guy's amazing. He's been doing ministry for like decades in this city. Doing such a great job, reaching so many people. And he must want to come here. He's wanting to come here to be with us, to see what's going on here at Lifeline Church. That's a real special thing. And it shows the unity and camaraderie that happens in the churches of Lodi. People don't realize how much camaraderie there really is in the church. So he's going to be here. I encourage you, show up, show out. It's going to be amazing. And it's not just for no reason either. There's actually this little thing uh, called Love Lodi. So let's talk about that. Love Lodi uh, happens uh, once a year, and it usually happens so close to Easter that we can't participate because we go hard for Easter. But this year, it's going to be on April 27th. That's a Saturday, um, April 27th. And something that all the churches like to do is all get involved. Um, and so you can sign up. More information is coming out on that. Um, but really, it's as simple as going to um, lovelodi.org. Not in my notes. I just remembered, y'all. Smart. I'm smart like that. <laughs> lovelodi.org. And you can just pick any, any service area you want. There's hundreds of things you can do. It's a citywide serve day. 
where you like you can plant plants and you can uh, we clean up yards together and all the churches come together and participate in this. It's really fun. And so something that the churches like to do is you know magical musical chairs, musical chairs. They like the musical chairs with like the the preaching and whatnot. And so that's why Glenn's coming. It's going to be awesome. So get excited for that. Let's talk about this family stuff, man. I love it. This is my favorite series all year, and we save it for right after Easter because I like to hit the ground running, especially right after a big day. People getting saved, people coming back to the Lord. I absolutely love it. But I want to lean into this most important area, which is family and and the people closest to us. It's true. It's true. They always get our worst. Why is that? I, I don't know why it is. They always see the worst side of us. Is it because we spend the most time with them? Is that why? Is it because our guard is down with them? And so we feel like the people that we should love the best... They get the worst of us. Man, what is going on with that? I don't understand it. Like we expect more from them. Why is it? So for whatever reason, that's the huge problem is that we show our worst to the people that we love the best. Now, before you say, not me. Oh no, pastor, I would never do that. Don't lie to me. First of all, this is church. You're not allowed to lie. You can't be lying. But maybe uh, you've done this. Maybe you've experienced this. You've been uh, getting ready in the morning. Okay, maybe you're heading somewhere with uh, your family, your kids. Maybe it was to church today and you're having a little discussion. That's what we like to call it in our house. We like to have discussions, discussions, you know, heated discussions where we have a little discussion. And then you're like, you know, yelling, bickering, whatever. It's like, you're going back and forth and then you show up. Oh, hello there. So blessed, blessing the Lord. Doing so good. Yes, it's good to see you too. I'm doing so good. How are you doing? Blessed. Blessed. Just got done yelling at each other. Blessed. Blessed. Or maybe it was the kids, you know, you're driving, driving to church. You're like, shut up. Back there. I'm going I'm to reach back there, man. man hook your back to- oh, blessed. Blessed. How are your kids? Oh, they're doing so good. So blessed. They're all like in there. Suddenly they're like scared. They can't even look at you. <laughs> they're like looking like, don't hit me. <laughs> just kidding. Don't. No, I'm just kidding. You would never do that. And maybe if you- so any adult, any adult who's like past the age of 18, 19 has experienced this. All right. But if you're a teenager in here, then you've definitely seen your parents do it. Come on, no raised hands. No, don't raise your hands in here because they're with you. Don't do it. But you, maybe you've seen that. You've seen your parents or your, your loved ones, you know, wagga, 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 and then they show up. Oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine. But what, why is it, man? Like, we don't hang out with our friends that way, all fighting and then trying to pretend everything. Why is it our family that always gets like that? that I, and I'm just, I'll be honest with you here. I'll be honest with you today. I struggle with this just as much as anybody else maybe a little better than you. I don't know. I'm not competitive about it, but I struggle with this too. There's a reason Pastor Tiffany and I come to church in two different cars. There's a reason. (laughs) It's a good reason too. All right. Early on, it's like, hey, we're leaving the same house. We're going to the same house. Might as well take the same vehicle, right? Wrong, <laughs> wrong, because we got different speeds. We got different things. We're going to like go through that yellow light. We're going to stop, but we're like, one of us is waiting on the other one. And then we just realize, you know what? Maybe, maybe you just drive yourself to church. It's okay. So now I drive alone and it, it's, it's just better for our relationship to do that. It's wisdom. It's wisdom is really what it is. It's wisdom. So be wise, be wise. But let me talk to you about this because this series, I'll just give you a little sneak peek. Tiffany and I are gonna go back and forth a little bit more often. Uh, It's gonna be like 50-50 throughout this whole thing. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring um, the ladies and the man's perspective to each one of these areas. And so I'm gonna be primarily speaking to guys as a guy, but it's, everyone's going to be able to glean from this. Everyone's going to be able to learn something. So if you're a lady, you're like, oh, well, I'll just wait for next week. No, 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 no. You're going to, you're going to be able to learn too, because you're going to be able to get inside your man's head a little bit better. All right. Cause I'm giving you, I'm giving you the insight. Um, so let me just speak to guys for a second, because I know guys might struggle with this a little bit more. Um, how do we go? How do we go from giving our best at work? You give your best at work, man. You're always working that overtime. You give your best at the golf course, man. Always a couple extra yards, man. You got that, mm, the hip flat, man. You're going for it. You're giving your best at work. You're giving your best at golf. You're giving your best at the gym, man. Always cranking out just a couple more LBs. Let's go. Staying in there a little bit longer, man. You're always giving your best. At, how do we go from giving our best in every other area to giving our very best at home instead of giving our leftovers? Because let's be honest. If somebody's going to get left over, it's probably going to be them. It's, it's, and it doesn't make any sense in our head, but it's what ends up happening more often than not. 
you go hard at work, you go hard at your hobbies, you go hard with everything else, but then the family gets kind of left behind. It's, it's very rare that the family's going perfectly, everything's going great at home, and you're like absolutely crushing it there, and everything else is wrong. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Maybe men feel a little bit more equipped to do well in the office than they do at home. Maybe guys feel a little bit more equipped to do well with their hobbies or at the gym than they do at home. Well, I want to flip that script. (laughs) And I want us to feel the most equipped to win with our families, this most important area of our life. Is anyone interested in this? Is anyone interested in how to get a little bit better from the Word of God? Come on. So I want to talk to you about marriage today. Uh, We want to do better. We we must do better. I'm going to talk to you about marriage. I'm going to talk to you about three stages of marriage. Three stages of marriage. How many stages could there be to marriage? Well, there's three. (laughs) I'm going to explain them to you. Three stages of marriage. Number one is this, getting ready for marriage. And so you're thinking, man, this is a a message on, on marriage. I guess I can tune out because I'm not married. No, 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 no. You're actually in an advantageous place because you can get yourself ready for the best marriage possible right now better than you could, all right? Um, The best time to work out your character is before you're married. (laughs) It's, It's a bummer to have to do it while you're married. So the first stage, getting ready for your marriage, you are at an advantage before you're married to actually work on your own character. And here's a statement I want to I wanna explain to you a little bit and talk to you about from the scriptures. Here's this statement. You can write this down if you're taking notes. Be the person, the person you're looking for is looking for. Be the person, the person you're looking for is looking for. I know that's a little bit confusing, so let me just explain it. Imagine your, your perfect spouse one day. Man, they, they got the values, the character, morals. They got that relationship with God cracking. They're like, it's all good. Everything's going great with them, okay? And you're picturing them, and there they are. Now, get inside their mind. What is that? So for men, what is that lady with good values, good morals, good character, a growing relationship with God? What do you suppose she's looking for? A guy with good values, good morals, good character, and a growing relationship with God. Isn't that right? And it goes both ways. All right, if you're looking for, and it's amazing to me that we go to the bar to look for a a great spouse and then think we're going to change everything up. It's like, man, you fishing in that pond. Don't be surprised when you catch a catfish. (laughs) I'm just saying, like, what, what what are you thinking? What are you thinking? It's like we, we think we got to go to where all the single people are, to the club, to the bar, to all these places, and, and you're, you're going, well, I'm going to find me a good person. No, think ahead. Think a little bit ahead. Be the person. The person you're really looking for is looking for, because when you get yourself ready, chances are that person might just show up. I got a story about that a little bit later I'm going to share with you, but it goes like this. Proverbs 18, 22. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure. Say treasure. Ooh, she's a treasure. She's a treasure. A man who finds a wife finds a treasure and receives favor from the Lord. So is this only for women? Only a woman can be a treasure that a man finds? No. A woman who finds a guy is going to also find a treasure if he's a treasure. What I'm trying to tell you is be the treasure because treasures are looking for treasures. Like attracts like. And so if, if you're like looking for that person go complete you, No, 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 no. Be the person. The person you're looking for is looking for. Is this ministering to anybody? Is this helping anybody? Any single people up in the house going, all right, I needed to hear that. Like, I want to be the right person so that I can attract the right person, so I can be with the right person, so I don't have to try again and do all of that. It's it's not it's not worth it. It's not good. You, You you it's wisdom to pause for a moment and go, who am I becoming? What am I doing with my life? Not just who am I, who am I going to find who's going to complete me? (laughs) You complete me. No, 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 no. Jesus completes you. And then once you become that treasure, once you become that right person and you, it's almost like once you become secure enough in yourself, then the right person tends to appear. All right. That's not a promise of any kind. There are some single people up in here. Like you said, you said they're going to appear. No, 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 no. All right. No, let's talk about marriage though. Let's talk about the marriage. Uh, second stage of marriage is the actual marriage. <laughs> the actual marriage. Now you're in it. Okay, you're married. Good. Glad for you. You're in the marriage. What do we need to do? What do we need to focus on? If I had one statement, one piece of advice I wanted to give 
to somebody is this. Always give 100%, never 50. Always give 100%, not 50. 100%, not 50. A 50-50 marriage, that's fun for nobody. That's fun. You know what that is? That's a score-keeping marriage. That's why I do my thing, and I'm checking up on you to make sure you're doing your thing. No, 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 no. Good marriage isn't 50-50. You know, you know what is 50-50? Divorce. That's 50-50. You don't want 50-50. Oh, well, I'm going to do my part. You're going to do your part over there. No, marriage is sacrifice. It's sacrifice. It's each person going in 100%. I have, until I have nothing left, I'm going to keep pursuing this. I'm going to keep on giving everything I have. I'm going to let myself, I, I will let myself go even, not in the, in the sense of letting myself go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sacrificial. I'm going to be sacrificial. I'm, I'm going to give my, I'm going to be selfless. I'm not going to give hundred percent and then check up on you to make sure you're doing your end of the bargain. No, I'm going to give hundred percent. That's my responsibility. I give hundred percent. Listen to this in Ephesians 5, 25 for husbands. This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. You know, he gave up 50% of his life you know, hoping that all those sinners out there would get it together. No, 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 no. He, he gave it up all the way. He gave it up all the way. When you say I do, you say, I'm going in 100%. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give everything I got to this, everything I got. Um, and we've got more talking to do about this because I know what some of you might be thinking. Marriage is learning selflessness. That's, if I had to like define marriage, <laughs> it'd be like learning selflessness learning how to live selflessly. If there is any kind of competition in marriage, it's who can serve who the most. That's the only competition there is in marriage is, is I'm going to give myself the absolute, I'm going to, I'm going to let the things that I love, desire, want down for the sake of you. That's what marriage is. That's what, that's what the Bible says. And some of you are thinking, well, that doesn't make any sense. No, I'm, I'm supposed to get out of this. I'm supposed to be the one receiving from this. That person was supposed to make me happy and they're not doing it. Play that tape out. Play that. Who, who are you? What wisdom? Where are you getting that wisdom from? Not from the Bible. Not from the word of God that teaches us all things, corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what's right. The Bible teaches us, no, he gave up his life for us. So we give up our life for our spouse. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, and this is real. I'm a... I'm a I'm going to slow it down for just a second because this is real talk. And this is when marriage is hard, really hard. I know what some of you might be thinking, what if they're not giving 100%? Like I'm giving my 100% and they are not. This is tough. This is really, really challenging. And it doesn't do anybody any good for us not to talk about like what that might look like. Like what if, what if my spouse, they're, they're stuck in their addiction. You have a spouse with an addiction. That is a tough situation to be in. What about a spouse that's been unfaithful? spouse that's been unfaithful. What about uh, clinical depression? Like they're depressed they, and they just cannot get off the couch. They cannot do anything. They're not motivated. And it's like, they're just there and I can't do anything about it. What then? What then? What do I do in that situation? Now, there are, there are two applications to this, two blanket statements. They're both wrong. They're both wrong. And this is how the church typically will respond. They'll say, well, you just never divorce anybody ever. Never, never, not ever. And that's not exactly biblical, is it? No, it's not. It's not. But there are some scriptures you can say, oh, well, you know, you're just never supposed to divorce. They could be doing all kinds of terrible things, totally all the worst kind of things, and you just never leave them ever. And I've experienced people who have come from that kind of background, and they're in a totally unhealthy relationship. Totally, it's abusive, and it's terrible. And they're like, well, I'm just, I guess, I guess I'm stuck. Well, there, are, there may be situations where that needs to happen, all right? But it's probably more rare than the people who are hungry for it <laughs> wish it would be. Now, there's the other side. There's the other side. Well, you know, it's just, it's time to separate because I'm just not happy. I'm just not happy. They're not meeting my needs. And so I'm going to leave them and find someone else to meet my needs and just be unhappy. Both of those, both of those are ditches on the side of the road that we don't want to land in. And there are no blanket statements. I wish there were that I could just tell you this one statement and it would gloss over that whole major issue of, well, what if my spouse is totally, totally stuck in something that's destructive, abusive, and it's 
like it's, it's just railing on everybody in the whole thing. They're all suffering because this, the other side of that is not, they're not in it. They're not in it. They left it a long time ago and they're not in it. It's, it's what do I do? What do I do? There's no blanket statement. So in that case, what I, my best advice I could possibly give you, and believe me, I, I've prayed through this. I've thought through this and I want to equip you. And the best advice I could start you off with is never make a life altering decision in isolation. What you need, anybody, what you need is godly, healthy people around you that can speak into your situation. Because here's what the scenario will look like. You are going, well, what do I do? What do I do with this marriage? What do I do? Um, I'm, I'm right and giving hundred percent, but they're not. What you need is like four or five godly people who know you speaking into that and saying, you know what? It's time for you to pray. You need to be praying. You need to get down on your knees. You need to redouble. You need to get after it because this is not whatever. When you got people speaking into that, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. That's what the Bible says. So that could be, so I'm, I'm imploring you, get godly men and women around you because they could also say, you know what? All four of them are going, you know what? This isn't healthy. This isn't safe. That you need to do something about this. What I don't want is for you to make that decision on your own. I don't believe it's, it's, I don't believe it's godly. I don't believe it's the wisdom of scripture. You, so I'm imploring you, begging you, asking you, Get into a life group. If you are anywhere near a situation like that, get into a life group. There is more than a dozen for you to choose from right now. Invite yourself. Go in there. You need people who are godly and wise to be able to speak into that situation. I know that was tough. I know that was hard, but we had to talk about that. And so if you're, if you're suffering and you're, you're, you're giving 100%, but it's just not getting anywhere, please, I beg you, get into a group. They will help you get through that process. Okay, third stage of marriage. Third stage of marriage is this, getting your kids ready for marriage. Because that's what, man, how many of us, man, if, if our parents would have just told us something, we would be a lot better off. Come on, somebody. Am I the only one? I, I got good parents, really good. I was raised in a fantastic home. My dad Salt of the earth, integrity, honesty. Like he was a strong, silent type, but he was always just rock solid right there. My mom, a legitimate therapist, okay? She'd cross her legs, be like, mm hmm, nodding her head. She's like, this is exactly what you need to do psychologically. I got my parents, they're dialed in, but they didn't sit me down. They didn't tell me, like, this is what you should look for in marriage, the kind of person you should. They didn't sit down and talk to me about that. Like, what if we made this a part of the thing? You already got to talk to them about the birds and the bees. Why don't we talk to them about marriage? Why don't we talk to them about the person they should be pursuing too? The third stage of marriage is getting your kids ready for marriage. So I'm going to say it like this. Show and tell. Show and tell the way a good marriage should be. Write that in your notes. Show and tell. Show in the home. Show what repentance looks like. Repent when you need to and let your kids see you do it. Show your kids what kind, and this is where, this is hard too, because this is talking about being right, <laughs> doing the right thing. So you can't show them the right thing if you're not doing the right thing. You don't have to say amen right there. I see you. It's, it's just brought up. I can see you. I can see you. Show them kind words. Show them that selfishness, selflessness. Show them the effect. Show them affection. Show them what a healthy marriage should look like. A little bit of healthy affection, showing your kids that they should see what it's like. They should see it. Show them what it's like to honor each other, respect each other, love each other. Show them that healthy relationship, but don't just show them. Also tell them. Listen to what the scripture teaches us in, in Titus 2.7. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Let me show you again. Be an example of your teaching. Do you see it? Be an example of your teaching. So don't just tell, show. Don't just show, tell. And, and this whole scripture, this whole chapter is on family. You think it's, oh, it's about what pastors ought to do. No, it's about what y'all ought to do. <laughs> it's about what y'all ought to do as fathers, as mothers, as, as husbands, as wives. Show and tell. Show and tell. So families ought to be the visible priority in our lives. Otherwise, we might just be fooling ourselves. It's called having blind spots. Anybody ever thought about their blind spots lately? And I'm not talking about driving your car. I'm talking about your life. We, in our life, we have blind spots. And so 
our families ought to be, hear me out, the visible priority in our lives. This is not for appearances. This is not just to keep up appearances. This is because your blind spots are blind spots because you don't see them. Other people see your blind spots. You don't see them. So I'm getting somewhere with this. I'm getting somewhere with this. We need to invite feedback. We all say, oh, I do it all for them. You know, especially guys do this all the time. All the time. You got to take my word for it. You know, as a pastor counseling and people asking advice, everybody, it's always, oh, it's all for them. I work 90 hours a week for my family. Sure, sure you do. Yeah, you never see them, but it's for them. We got that three-story house, a couple boats, nice big truck. It's all for them. Okay, sure it is. Yeah. You know, your, your, your kids are probably better off if you work 40 hours a week like a normal human being and actually saw them. But we say things because we don't see it sometimes. We don't see what we're doing because we have blind spots. And I'm speaking as a man to men. I'm saying as a man, we have blind spots. And we, we think, oh, man. Oh, I'm, I'm working hard for them. I'm doing all this for them. But it's not for them. We don't see how we're actually kind of suffering. Our families are suffering and we are suffering because we're not happy as we want to be. We say we do it all for them, but our lives and our actions say otherwise. Our lives and our actions say otherwise. Sometimes we just don't notice. And our spouse is either too nice or doesn't know how to point it out to you. And when they do point it out to you, you take it as criticism, get all mad. And that goes both ways, doesn't it? Come on now. So I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to take the marriage challenge. Take the marriage challenge. Now, I Googled it. There are other marriage challenges out there. This is my own marriage. This is the one I made up. Okay, so if you go Googling marriage challenges, there's a bunch of them out there. But I'm, I'm talking about something specific, something very actionable today. Very actionable. Take the marriage challenge. Let them tell you how you're doing. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? But it's not. <laughs> if you've ever done it, it's not. It's hard. It's challenging. This is a real challenge. Let them tell you how you're doing and then give it your best shot to do it. Everyone I know, men and women included, loves a challenge. I was just watching Tiffany yesterday. Tiffany yesterday was playing some video games. That's right. She plays video games every once in a while. We got that Wii U up in the house. All right. We got that Super Smash Bros. cracking. And the main boss in this Super Smash Bros. is the ultimate hand. What's it called? Master hand. Master hand. That's right. It's like this hand, right? Out there. It's like trying to get you. Somebody out there knows what I'm talking about, right? One guy. Okay, cool. It was a guy, right? Video games, right? Okay, two. All right. Very good. Master hand is out there and... You should have seen her. She was, she was getting it just like going like this. Like going like this. Hey, men and women alike love a challenge. We love a challenge. You know, and if it helps you, if it helps you, this is what I'm saying. Make your marriage like a hobby. Getting better. Like, like improving. Practice. Put time, money, energy in. Let me tell you about one of my hobbies. Then this, let me show you one of my hobbies. This, this, this set right here costs about as much as my first car, all right? And so, like, this is my baby right here. And I got all the little gizmos, all the little gizmos. Golf is, is fun for me. I've invested my time into it. I've invested my money into it. I got all the little stuff, man. I can tell you right now. Let's just see. My buddy in the back. There he is right there. How many yards away are you? Uh, let's see. Uh, seven yards, man. It doesn't seem like a long way, but it is. All right. So here I got my little brush right here. It's like, look at this head cover. It's got the little magnet on it. This is perfect, man. And you ain't a real golfer unless you got you a sunbrella. This is no umbrella. This is a sunbrella. Keep the sun off you, man. Because if you golf enough, okay, you gotta. You, you don't want to get all sunburned. You gotta stay classy, right? You don't want to wear a bucket hat. You want to be that guy. I am that guy. <laughs> I actually do do that. But I got me a sunbrella too, man. I got a little, I got a little gizmo that goes on my little cart and it, right there. But, uh, and these are some wiffle balls, some practice balls, because if you want to be good at something, you got to practice. And so my favorite club right here, my favorite club right here is the, is the 60 degree wedge. Man, you can see it's still got some grass on it. How many of you think I can make it into the production booth? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> production booth in the back? You're going to look, they're so ready. I ain't going to do that, man. That would be negligent. <laughs> I mean, I'm not scared. We have a really good lawyer here, so I'm not scared. Like, it's just a <laughs> wiffle ball. I'm not worried about it. But somebody on this side, make a, make a, make a hole for me. Go ahead. Anybody on this side? Right, right there. Okay. 
You ready right here? You ready right here? Okay. You see this right here? Little twist. That's class right there. Okay. Okay. This is what you want to do. Back foot, close stance, one of these. Oh, it was so close though. I'll try one more time. Hold on. One more time. Hold on, one more. She's like, nah. Okay, here's one. Here's one right here. Should I do a flop shot? No, I shouldn't. All right, here we go. One, back foot, open. What's up? What, what do you have to say now, huh? Mmm, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, there was, a, there was a chance that was gonna go way bad for a long time. I got like five more balls up here. How was I able to get any kind of skill with that? How was I able to do that? You have to practice feedback. Back foot, shaft lean, whatever. People told me that years ago. And what did I do? Uh, idiot, get out of here. What do you know? I'm going to do it my way. No, no. I learned from the people who could see what I was doing. Because I used to stand like, like this. And they straightened me up. They got me dialed in. Your marriage is the same way. You need someone showing you, man, stance is weird right now. You need to get, you need to, like, I'm hearing you talk to your wife. That's not right, bro. And listen to this. There's no one better than your spouse that knows your blind spots. You can do this with friends. Yeah, but that's a cop out, really. You need to do it with your own spouse because your spouse is forced to do it. What is that word? Unelicited? Non-solicited? I'm a talker. I talk good for a living even. Your spouse is forced to tell you your feedback without, without being asked. And so it comes across as, as an attack when what I'm asking you to do, ask them, hey, how, how's, what's my care, what, what could I be doing better? What, what could I be doing better in my life? How could I be loving you better? How could I be loving the kids better? What's, what's going on with me? And this is, a, this is a challenge. Ask them, how am I doing? How am I doing? You, you can say it in your own way, your own, I mean, and you can put this into practice today. You may not want to, <laughs> And I'm if you if you want to get better, if you want to get be if you want your marriage to be better, if you want your home life to be better, you probably uh, have a life of improvement and enjoyment. You probably get to play more golf more often too, if not even better than that. If you did more stuff like this, ask them how am I doing? How can I show you I love you better? The kids, where's my technique? getting rusty? Where, where am I kind of, where am I slipping? Where am I losing it? And guess what? It's going to open the door for them to feel like they, they can do the same thing, but it doesn't matter what they do. This is not a message for them. It's a message for you. Uh, you're like husband and wife are sitting right next to each other. And who am I talking to? You. <laughs> it's not for the other person to do. It's for you to do. Husbands, it's for you to do. Wives, it's for you to do. You're the one who is a lot. You are the only one who can open that door into improvement in your life. And if you don't think this is biblical, if you think I'm kind of like getting wacky with it, oh, come on. I had to narrow down the scriptures that all talk about this. Let's begin, shall we? Proverbs 18, 2. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing their own opinion. Oh, like they don't want to be told. A fool's know it all. A fool knows it all. Man, you don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. You're a fool. You're a fool. You're a fool. Go ahead. Go ahead, be all fooled out. It's cool. Go, go get after it. That's, I mean, that's just what the book of wisdom teaches us. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding where their blind spots are, in understanding how they can get better, how understanding how they can be better in the relationship. But they delight in telling everybody, oh yeah, I got all this figured out. They delight in doing that. That's not enough though. Let's keep it going. Proverbs 27. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Look, some people would rather be lied to about how good they're doing. Let's take it back to golf for a second. Man, I'm out here playing with my friends and I hit it and I just fan that thing into the water. And they're like, that was just the wind, bro. You're perfect. 
You're perfect. Some people would just rather be lied to. They'll, they'll find an excuse for everything. Oh, it was a rock right there. And then, someone, then, then all their friends would tell them, oh yeah, it was probably a rock, dude. Your form is perfect. They're like, yeah, good stroke, bro. Yeah, cool. That's what the Bible's saying is that, is that the kisses of an enemy, man, if I want someone to fail at golf, I'm not going to tell them nothing. I'm going to say, oh, you're doing so good. Yeah, you just keep it up. Yeah, chip like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. keep doing that. That's an enemy. An enemy won't tell you what's going on, but the wounds of a friend, somebody who's going to tell you the truth, someone who's going to tell you what hurts, but it's going to help you improve, that's a friend right there. That's a friend. Oh, I like this one. Psalm 141. Let the godly strike me. Bring it on. I want to hear it. It will be a kindness. If they correct me, it will be a soothing medicine. Don't let me refuse it. What what, what I'm trying to say is this is going to hurt. This is not going to feel good, but it's like medicine. It's going to make you better. Oh my God, I hope you're seeing this, that this is all throughout scripture. I had to narrow this down. There's scriptures all over the place about asking for, hey, how, what, what am I doing? How can I improve? How can I get better? Because marriage is learning selflessness. It's learning how to lay yourself down and go in 100%. Take this marriage challenge. Let them tell you how you're doing and then give it your best shot to do it. Other than God, marriage is the most important relationship in your life. There is no other relationship found in the word of God or, and and we all know this, no other relationship is more important other than your relationship with God. Marriage is the most important. It's the one relationship that reflects how our relationship with God ought to be. It's that selflessness. It's that sacrifice. Marriage is the most important relationship in your life. It affects every area. It affects every area of your life. I hear, and you probably do too, half of marriages fail. And that's in and outside the church. It's no respecter of persons because marriage is hard. Selflessness is hard. We suffer. The kids suffer. That is not what I want to see in the house of God. That is not how I want us to live. It's it's not satisfactory to me to have a growing church with, with failing marriages and families. That is not success. That is not success. No, I, I want us to all take the challenge to give ourselves up, to, to let ourselves, to let ourselves be vulnerable enough to say, this is I, I want to grow in this. We struggle with this challenge. I bet if we were honest with ourselves, the last time we asked for true, honest feedback from our spouse was maybe never. I want want to, uh, let's make this a part of our regular rhythm of life to invite feedback, to bring people in, to to let people say, it can be a friend, it can be someone close to you, but they better be way close. What if this season, your marriage became the best it ever was? It can, it can. And it starts with this. It starts with this idea of receiving correction. If it's it's going on anywhere in our life, it ought to be coming in our marriage. What if we put our best energy into becoming the right person, into giving 100% in our marriage and gave 100% to to showing and telling the kids, do you think our life would be better? Do you think it'd be more fulfilled? Of course it would. I'm giving you permission to give your best, to take the challenge and we can change not only our lives, but we can change the world through this. I mean, what if, what if we shirred up our, our marriages and our relationships in this way, and then our kids reap the benefit, and then their kids, and then their kids, and the whole family tree gets changed because we became willing to get selfless enough to start accepting correction about our blind spots. It's, it seems so simple, but it's so profound. It's so big. There is a secret sauce, of course, It's Jesus, having Jesus at the center of our relationships. I'll be honest with you. um, When I first got saved, I got saved as an adult and I was uh, 21 years old. I got saved in the Salvation Army rehab and I I didn't go to church anywhere for a couple years. So I was 21, 22, 23, didn't go to church anywhere. And you know, I'm I'm thinking just like any other 22 year old, I want to get married, I want to have a relationship. But I wasn't in the church and no one was teaching me the word of God about dating and marriage and all that. And so I was just dating whoever I could. I was just dating. I was dating around, having friends with whoever, and I wasn't thinking about any of this stuff. 
So before I met Tiffany, I was not thinking about having Jesus at the center. I was just thinking about finding the right person so that I could be happy. Finding the right person so that I could have a relationship, whatever. I'll spare you the, the details, but it goes something like this. A couple years in, and after starting coming to this church, and of course I met Tiffany, I'm like, okay, that's good. That's, I like church a lot. This is great. <laughs> But right around that same time, I made a decision in myself because, you know, there was a couple swings and misses, you know, a couple dating relationships that were like, what is this? What am I doing? Because I had God, I had the Lord, I was saved and I was going, what is, what is up? Like something's not aligning. And I had this epiphany. I had this awakening where God kind of spoke to me and called the Holy Spirit or wherever but I just realized I don't want to, I don't want to pursue anybody that isn't pursuing Jesus. I don't want to pursue anybody that isn't pursuing Jesus like I want to. So I started pursuing Jesus in a different, on a different level. And I, I told you the story uh, several times, but if you're newish, you know, I, I started getting different jobs so I could be around here more. I started pursuing Jesus, everything I had. Because the secret sauce is having Jesus at the center. It's like you're pursuing God. You're pursuing the Lord. And then you're, you're seeing him. And then out of the periphery, you begin to see someone running alongside you who's also pursuing Jesus. You're not necessarily pursuing each other. You're both pursuing Jesus. And you're like, hey, you got the same pace as me, don't you? Let's run this race together. Ecclesiastes 4. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You know another way to say that? Jesus is that third cord. Jesus at the th any relationship with Jesus at the center is not easily broken. If you want a relationship that's not easily broken, put Jesus back at the center of your relationships or maybe for the first time. Maybe that's the decision that some of us need to come to the table with right now is to say, you know what? I've been trying every other way except just pursuing God in my own heart, in my own self, with my own life. You can't put Jesus at the center if he's not at the center of your own heart. He can't be at the center of relationship. He's not at the center of you. So now is the opportunity. I want to just give you an invitation to, to make him the center of your life so that he can be at the center of your relationships. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes together. It's a great time to pray. Let's put Jesus at the center of our lives. Father, I ask for open hearts and open minds today. And we just receive your love today. We receive your love. Everything that you want to do in our lives, all the circumstances that led us to this moment, Lord, we, we just acknowledge and recognize it's you. You've been drawing us in. You have been drawing us closer to your heart. You've been pursuing us. And just like the scripture says, you stand at the door and knock. All we do is open. Today, I pray that we would open the door of our heart to let you in fully, completely, truly, once and for all and forevermore. So I'd like to pray for two groups of people. Maybe you, uh, maybe you used to have a relationship with him, used to be pretty close, but somewhere along the way that you just drifted from him and drifted from your true good relationship with God that you've always had, but something happened in some kind of situation and you're ready to come home and there might even be some guilt and shame around that because you know better. I wanna tell you there's no guilt and shame. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so coming back to him, there is no shame there. There is no guilt there. You can come straight home and get right back into where you belong. No shame, no guilt. You're coming right back home. God is pleased to see it. And then there are some of us here that we've never really made that decision on our own. We've never gone all in on our own accord. We've never even tried it. And if that's you today, I just want to say we, we, as a church, have been praying you here. Week in, week out, we consistently have been praying you in. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to just receive God, receive his love, receive his forgiveness, and to turn over the controls of your life to him. So if I described you in any kind of way and you want to be included in this prayer we're going to pray, would you just lift your hand with me and say, that's me. I want to pray with you. If that's you, just lift it up. Amen. I see you. Hallelujah. Is there anyone else that wants to pray that prayer today? Amen. I see you too. Hallelujah. Is there anybody else? This is a private moment. 
Amen. I see you. So church, this is what I want to do. Whether you raise your hand or not, I want us all to pray this prayer together. If you believe it, just pray it with me. It's a repeat after me situation. But if it's in your heart, pray it just like you're praying it just straight from your own heart. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Make me new. Forgive me of my sin and fill me with your spirit. I turn over all the controls of my life to you. Thank you for making me new. Amen.